that we want you to be made aware of starting next week already. We're so signing up for the nativity, the drive through nativity. Of course, our biggest event throughout the year, uh, inviting all the neighborhood in. Uh, we also have a Facebook page set up for that now, and I hope you'll look for that and friend it to your friends. I don't know how well that works, but if you're on Facebook, you know how to do that. And uh, it'll be good advertising for us. We'll go out amongst uh, all the friends in the neighborhood that you have, all your friends, and invite them to the drive through nativity. But starting next week, we'll start signing up for those of us here that need to be actively involved. This is your opportunity to serve. Anything from preparing foods and snacks to working inside here with uh, uh, helping people get dressed, we need parking lot help, and of course, setting up for all the actors. There's some uh, 40 or 45 actors that we need each hour of those three months. So it's December 19th or 18th, 19th, and 20th. So put that on your calendar and be ready for that. Uh, also, if you need your seniors, if you need your leaves rate, Jeff is still looking for some opportunities. And Cornerstone as well, so we have a lot of kids that are willing to go out there and do that. Uh, that is going to be next Sunday at the church in the afternoon. So make sure you call the office this week or see Sue or Jeff or I today, and we'll make sure we get you arranged. Tonight, dinner at 5.30, as usual, 6.30. We have both traditional service uh, and also small groups that you can join. Uh, missionary Christmas gift offering box is in the back now, and you uh, can make yourself aware of that so you can use that. Uh, it'll only be out for the next couple of weeks, and then we have to get those missionary gifts out. And then one special announcement. Here's one that's not in the bulletin, but something to think about. This year, our huge Christmas tree that will be up here, and it'll be set up the last November of, uh, of this month, is going to be a family tree to go along with our scheme and everything that we're doing. So what we would like you to do is choose an ornament that represents your family and bring that in, and that will be your ornament on the tree. So all of our families will be represented by a particular ornament. Now, don't go, don't bring me a full-size basketball because you love basketball. Make it a normal-size ornament. But to give you a for instance, my family, we love the Phillips. We have uh, all kinds of Phillips ornaments. So guess what you're getting? Okay? So that would represent our family. So whatever you think it is, uh, just bring it in. We're going to have a family tree, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, starting next week, we'll have a table in the back, and we'll be collecting these ornaments. So you have two Sundays to remember to do this. 
and then we'll have it ready. So that means some of the guys you got to go up in the attic and figure out the Christmas stuff a little early to find that one ornament that you want to use. Now, on a more serious note, we have two very special prayer requests that we want to share with you this morning. Uh, Stan Carroll is in uh, Pottstown Hospital. He took a fall uh, a couple days ago, and we family Dave went over and kind of rescued him for that time being. But the following day, he was unresponsive at home. Uh, so his uh, family came up, got him to the hospital. So we're going to pray for Stan, who's uh, in the hospital there, and we're not sure what's going on with him yet. Also, uh, Paul Levinger went up to Reading for a test to decide what to do with some blood clots that they wanted to treat. And during the procedures, the x-rays found out he has uh, an unidentified cancer that is in most of his organs in his stomach area. Uh, so it's very serious. He hasn't seen the oncologist yet, and that will come early in the week. Uh, so there's a lot of questions as to what the next step will be and how it could be treated. Uh, so please remember Paul and Stan in your prayers. I'm going to take a moment right now for you to pray silently for them, and then I'll close. Gracious Father, we are so thankful that we have the opportunity to carry these heavy burdens to the one that you handle them. That you are indeed the one that carries the burden. That you know Paul and Sam in a very wonderful way, loving them, serving them. And now as they and their families go through this difficult time, Father, of uncertainty, this desert experience, we know that you will be their green tree, that you will offer the city from day to day, where we pray that you will give their doctors skill and wisdom and knowledge to uh, suggest the treatments that would work, that we know that ultimately you are the great physician. What peace that brings us to know that we turn things over to an almighty, all powerful God. And Father, we call upon you now to. Join us as we worship you by lifting the name of your Son. Thank you for being in our presence. In Jesus name. Great is the Lord, the most worthy of praise in the city of our God, His holy mountain. It is beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth. But the endless heights of Zaphon is not Zion, the city of the great king. Thank you. 
I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple, and I will, uh, I will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. Who is exalted above all things, your name and your word.
For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering, and so He condemned sin in sinful men. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, we do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Scary world, you know, and uh, the atrocities killing up our 
miles around him. But uh, through every storm, we know we can hold on to the Savior and say that it is well with our soul. The Lord will sing, it is well with my soul.
Jesus, so thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Lord, my life, my salvation. Who shall I fear? Who shall I be afraid? Your name is great and worthy to be praised. For the Lord comes to die for enemies. Lord Jesus, for their plans. Keep us safe. Keep us in your world. We learn from your word as the hope and your coming plan. Amen. Amen. Good morning. What a wonderful thing to be able to say is, well, it's my soul. It's, I think winter is finally here. But this morning, if anybody got up early, it was a beautiful, sober eyes, just filled the sky with red, orange, green, and blue. What a wonderful thing it is to God's creation that we can enjoy and say. Just think what it will be. Well, where we have a bee heaven and the bee heaven. Okay, now let's uh, read the Word of God. We're on Second Peter 3, verse 10. Turn to Satan. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and let God be wise as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Father, we are amazed when we think of what you have done for us as believers. You have sent your Son to shed his blood for our sins. You have helped us and guided us through, through this life. Father, there's so many things in this life that are against your will. Satan is working in the lives of people. And Father, we thank you that. We can trust in you because we have the Lord Jesus in our, in our lives. The Holy Spirit is living within us. We pray that we might take full advantage of the blessings you have and not take so many things for granted. Help us, Lord, to see that you are the one who can give us strength for each day. No matter what happens in this world, nothing happens with to your life. And Father, we pray for those who have lost people over there in France, those who have died, and we pray for the families. And we pray, Father, for the leadership there and, and here. That the right decisions might be made for the future, Lord. But Father, we look forward to the rapture of the church when we all go home to be with you. We pray, Father, for you to help us to look forward to this time. You know, Lord, that you love us and you have everything before us is for the good. And we praise you for your love. And we pray, Father, as we worship you this morning, that you speak to us through your word, work through our pastor. Thank you for the hymns and songs of praise this morning. Help us, Lord, to get close to you and to go out and to show others Christ in us. In Jesus' name. So, as we sing the song for Officer, the word will be on the screen. If you know it, you want to sing along, feel free. But if not, I want you to pay attention to the message of this song as your mind brings in the group.
Jesus comes in the clouds of the air for us. Listen, get up and greet someone. You're part of the body of Christ, right? If you know Christ, you're Savior, you're the bride. Turn your attention to an item of praise. If you look in your bulletin, if you haven't noticed there at the bottom of the page, last week's general fund offering was $17,000. God has blessed us in a marvelous way, folks. Continues to bless us. And just by way of uh, going to the end of the year, it's coming very quickly. And the plans for the auditorium here are moving forward. Uh, we're actually talking to people about specifics now. I'm sure we'll get some uh, uh, updated reports very soon. But uh, you know that it's uh, become quite a tradition here at the end of the year, the last offering uh, of the year. Uh, to do that, and it's been uh, to take a special offering that really goes to the building or to uh, completing the building here. It's part of the general fund now, but uh, that will be specifically earmarked for that. So pray about that. Uh, that uh, we're going to get some solid figures on what it's going to cost to start to convert this into a formal uh, worship center or auditorium. And uh, God continues to open up doors for us, doesn't it? And I know it's going to be a busy time of the year, but as is, uh, Pastor Bill Nass, the guy's in the he's almost here already. Uh, but let's pray that we have a real outreach uh, to the community. And that uh, because of that, we'll be able to present the gospel. And because of that, some might come and join us uh, for our cantatas and for the special uh, Christmas services and just come uh, and become part of the assembly here on a regular basis. Let's, let's just have a look at that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and goodness to us. We thank you that we are people who are blessed beyond measure. Help us never to forget that. Father, even though we may be living in some trying times, uh, the burden of 
greatness of your coming shines upon us. We know uh, that, Father, each day brings us a day closer. But while we're here, Father, we want to wait expectantly. We want to uh, be a people who are living uh, as ones who belong to you, uh, as chaste virgins, spiritually speaking. Father, we pray that we might be people of your word, and as we look into your word, uh, that you might, uh, your spirit might lead God and direct us to the truth, and that we might embrace it and live it out. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many people nowadays are uh, living in the now. Even Christians, unfortunately, you know, they're, they're really enamored. They're, they, they have really settled into this world. And, and it's affected very much the way they live. It's affected their testimony for Christ. And, and they just have such an affection for the things of this world and this world system uh, that they're really being ineffective and looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus and looking for the future and what the, the future has in store for this world and this world system in which we live. I don't understand how we can be enamored with the things of the world. You know, you look at this week, well, look at just this weekend. Uh, 129, that's the number right now, killed in Paris. Uh, 252 wounded are the numbers right now. This is a violent world. And uh, yes, there are things of beauty to see here, uh, but this world is a world of chaos. And it's a world that's getting uh, more and more difficult to live in. Before all of this uh, terrorist activity uh, took place again, which we're, uh, I hope that you realize is going to be pretty much a constant uh, for us, and, and uh, it's going to become more and more difficult. It's probably just a matter of time uh, until they strike in America again. Uh, we should not be surprised by that. Uh, we are in a battle battle of cultures. We are in a battle uh, for control uh, of the world uh, and the control of our society. Before this happened this week, what was it all about? Things happening on college campuses. We raised a whole generation on college campus. Our college campuses are disintegrating. And, and I saw that, you know, where we have a lot of young people, you know, they, they've been taught to be activists, uh, but they're activists really for nothing. They stand for nothing. They, they run on their emotions. We've had uh, uh, heads of colleges dismissed, or oh, they're forced to resign. So basically, they were fired because their students don't feel a certain way. It's terrible to live in a state where a person can be fired, not for any just cause only because people feel so way about it. I don't feel so much for these colleges because these colleges sowed to the wind and now they're reaping a whirlwind. They've created a monster on college campuses which is now turning upon itself and devouring itself. Why would we be so enamored why is the body of Christ so enamored, so much of it, with the world in which we live? Living in the now instead of living for the new. As we turn to our passage this morning, and we're coming uh, you know, toward the end of our study in the uh, book of 2 Peter, and we're in 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to pick up with Pastor Jeff left off in verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. We're going to try to get through the next three or four verses. I doubt that we're going to make it this morning, and I don't want to rush through this, because I think it is so important. And it has to do with prophecy. And a lot of Christians, especially I think a lot of Brians, we like prophecy. And, and a lot of fundamental Bible church people, they love prophecy. And you see prophecy and they got their charts. And you have your notes. Uh, but a lot of people really don't see anything practical in prophecy. But I'm going to tell you this morning that prophecy is vital. It's not taught in many churches any longer. Because people say it's not practical. What difference does it make? Nobody knows. We see in here and we really can't figure it out, so why bother with it? 
But I'm going to tell you it's very important that we promote prophecy. When I hear people say, you know, Pastor, why should we study prophecy? And, and, and it's, it's just a focus on, on sensationalism. And, and, and prophecy really in the church many times leads to strife and discord. And it's really not practical at all. Or they say, is it practical? Can you show me where prophecy is practical? Well, Peter would give a resounding yes. He would give a yes. You mark it down. You mark this down. And, 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 and even in First John, John talked about, beloved, you can mark it down because what you are looking for will strongly influence how or what you are living for. We have a, a clear view of what's going to happen. Then it will give us a direction in life. And instead of living for the now, we can live for the new. If you're a believer, and you're focused on this world which is passing away, then you're living a dying life. We talk about living for the lusts of this world. He said, you're living in a dying life. God wants us to be watchful, ever mindful. That one day he's going to tell his son, go get your bride. He's saying about that, and Ryan was doing motions to it. Paul tells us that believers are the only people who really know how to live in a dying world, in a temporal world, in a world that is passing away. Paul said, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're passing away. But the things which are not seen are eternal. That's 2 Corinthians, which tells that. Verse 4, verse 18. Uh, chapter 4, verse 18. And Peter now is coming to the close of the book, and he's saying, these people, you've been under pressure, and, and you're living in difficult times. And your focus needs to be on the future. Not on this world, but on the world to come. And uh, this just started us in with the day of the Lord. And I'm going to pick up with that. and says that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It's going to come upon people unexpectedly. The day of the Lord is, is kind of a bit of a difficult concept to master because it's throughout the Scripture and it means different things at different places. Many showers, who, for many of us, is one of the great handlers of prophecy and, and uh, uh, has so much to say about it, but he says this about the day of the, of the Lord refers to God's special interventions into the course of world events to judge his enemies, accomplish his purpose for history, and thereby demonstrate who he is, the sovereign God of the universe. That's the broadest sense of the day of the Lord. And there have been many days of the Lord throughout history. But what we're going to focus in on what Peter speaks about is the future, the future day of the Lord, which is coming. We're going to look, and here's your chart. I said, how do you do by the you chart? Well, here's your chart. Uh, it's a little bit running off of the uh, thing there, but hey, Lacey and I produced this, so, you know, what you get. Uh, I, I actually think it's, it's a pretty good. It's a pretty good job. I'll tell you something. When he talks about the day of the Lord. He, he's talking about a twofold nature of the day uh, of the Lord. The day of the Lord is more, you know, most of us have studied scripture and, and brought up that the day of the Lord is judgment, it's darkness. And certainly there's that part of it. But there's also a time, uh, you know, a nighttime of darkness and judgment, but it's a time of blessing in daylight. The day of the Lord is not just one day. It is many days. The time of darkness, just like the Jewish day, in the evening and the morning was a day. The evening, the darkness, but then comes the brightness, the time of light. Darkness speaks of judgment. Daytime speaks of divine rule and blessing. And so when we study the day of the Lord, we have to look, as 
And it sounds like the difference between the future broad day of the Lord and the narrow day of the Lord. That day. It comes in phases. Now let me put you on to this graph a little bit. And what they're singing about and what we're looking for is the rapture of the church. Oh, one one. Notice that the Lord comes in the clouds of the air. And I'll have time to turn to all these references when we give you a little bit. Uh, first of all, you are here. You're like right here, waiting for this. Right here, waiting for this. If you study the scriptures, if you see Christ your Savior, you can be here. Right now, and that hour doesn't come to earth because in the rapture, Christ does not return to earth. That is not his second coming. That is not the perusal which Jeff was speaking about. Jesus doesn't come facing back here to the end of Daniel 70, 70th week or the tribulation period. I keep hitting the wrong button. My own chart. Two and a half years, three and a half years. This is the great tribulation of the second half. And here's where that break comes. Uh, the tribulation begins not with the rapture. A lot of us were kind of taught that and we're always assumed, okay, the rapture comes and you go into seven years tribulation. There's at least a brief break in there. Could be a couple months. Just to get I talked about maybe even a couple years for things that could happen there, like the battle of God and May God and the rapture and in these Israel, that could actually happen now, but it could be after the rapture. But what starts uh, what starts the tribulation period is that the Antichrist will make a peace treaty with Israel of seven years. And then in the middle of that seven years, he will enter the temple or a rebuilt temple or a tabernacle of some sort there, and he will break that treaty and proclaim himself to be God. Right there. And you'll have all the great, uh, the whole seven years will have woes, and but there will be a great market increase in those things, and the testification in the book of Revelation over the last three and a half years that will culminate with the Lord Jesus' second coming when he returned to earth with the saints. If you know Christ as your Savior now, you won't be here for the tribulation. You'll be in heaven for those seven years. And then you'll return with Christ on his Angels at his second coming, and he will establish his millennial kingdom. He'll be put all enemies under his feet there, and then he will rule and reign the Lord Jesus Christ from Jerusalem for a thousand years. Millennial means thousand. For a thousand years, he will rule and reign there. Now, so when does the future day of the Lord begin? Most Bible teachers and those who are dispensations of which we are very strongly in that camp, would say that the broad day of the Lord begins right here. And Antichrist makes that covenant. Some would say here, but I think there's more scriptural support for this position. And that extends that here is the darkness, the night, the judgment time. From here to here, the seven and a half years. And then comes the daytime of the broad day of the Lord. It goes right here from the second coming of Christ to the end of the millennium. At the end of the millennium, there'll be one final rebellion when Satan is loosed in the pit for that thousand years. Satan is bound and he's in the pit in hell. But he's loose and he raises a, a rebellious mankind against uh, even a millennial rule of Jesus Christ. That those people be raised up for those who are born in that thousand years. Uh, only those who enter into the world can, they will all be people, tribulational saints who survived the tribulation, but they will have children throughout that thousand years. And those children will need to be saved, and some will not. They will rebel again, even in that perfect environment uh, that Christ brings. And then the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord comes to an end. Ah, this is really starting to tick me off. 
I just keep, you know, promoting that stereotype that I have no uh, capability of electronic things and I keep making it for myself, you know, but that's, yeah, that's the way it is. But, you know, when Christ comes back and he puts us in that judgment, he says, listen, Satan and the rebellious of all time, we've had our day. We've had our time. But well, even the judge there in tribulation says, now it's the day of the Lord. Now I will judge. Now I will bring things to rule. God will intervene in the tribulation. And he will terminate Satan's rule during that tribulation period. He will bring an end to rebellious mankind's rule. And he will judge them. I know that some people now try to spiritualize things away or, or try to downplay a lot of that and say, well, you know, there's going to be an end of the world, but it'll be some kind of natural process, some kind of natural calamity, a uh, nuclear war. But listen, this is going to include not man-made natural events. It is God's judgment to the power of Christ. And God says the rule of mankind rebellious mankind, the world system, and Satan usurping it. That comes to an end. And it comes to a mark, you know, where it, says, it talks about that day and, and this great and terrible day of the Lord. That's the second coming. Where you have the climax of the broad day of the Lord. And uh, when he says, he uh, refers to that as the narrow day of the Lord. Right here, when Jesus comes back, and puts his feet upon him, and you'll be with him, riding as an army. But he will do the fighting. But we will come to rule and to reign with him. A period of divine dominion over this world system. A thousand years. You know, you hear people say, like, oh, you know, these Christians want to do anything. They want a theocracy. Listen, I'll tell you what, this world will be a whole lot better place if we were in a theocracy. But we are not capable of doing that anyway. But when Christ comes, he will rule and reign from Jerusalem, and it will be a theocracy, and we will see that that's the greatest form of government because Christ will be seated on the throne. The God man is a significant day. Don't read past it. You want to know more about the day of the Lord and about the millennial kingdom, probably the best place to go is the book of Isaiah and see how important he considers it. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11, he says, The proud look of men will be abased, and the loftiness of man will be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. This is such an important day, this time in history, that he doesn't even use the word in the day of the says, in that day. For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. Remember, the has been doing with those who are false teachers and those who are usurpers, those who are trying to lead God's people astray. Isaiah in chapter 2, verse 17 says, And the pride of man will be humbled, and the loftiness of men will be abased, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Verse 20, In that day, Men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship. What? No one stands in that day except for the Lord alone. Isaiah 42, he says, In that day, the branch of the Lord. Who's the branch of the Lord? Jesus, the Messiah. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. Isaiah 10, 20, Now it will come about in that day that the remnant of Israel, the believers, and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped and never again rely on the one who struck them, but will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, a remnant will return, the remnant of God to the mighty God. We study in the book of Isaiah. It's a big book. 
There's a lot to say about the millennial kingdom, about what God's going to do for the nation of Israel. And the tribulation is focused on Israel and bringing them back. But we have a part in the too, because we'll be in heaven during the tribulation and at the marriage feast of the Lamb. We'll return with Him. We're going to rule and reign during the millennial kingdom along with Christ. When it comes to earth, Joel, chapter 2, verse 31, calls it the great and terrible day of the Lord. Not just terrible in that there's judgment, but it's also in the end and culmination and victory to Israel. And we'll be riding with him and enjoying that victory along with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the Bible, and there's that word terrible doesn't just mean awful or or or, you know, negative, it has this awesomeness about it. It's a great and awesome day of the Lord. See, for believers in Christ, day of the Lord is an, is an anticipation of, of hope. It brings blessing to us. It brings relief to us. It brings victory to all of God's people. But the day of the Lord for unbelievers... There's no hope there for them. There's no blessing for them. It holds only judgment and damnation. Isaiah talks about his coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation. And he will exterminate its sinners from it. That's Isaiah 13. Jeremiah says it's a day of vengeance. So as to avenge himself, so as God to avenge himself of his foes, a slaughter for the Lord God of hosts. Ezekiel says it's a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Joel says it's near in verse 1, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. In verse 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says again, Surely it is near, great and very awesome. Who can endure it? It will be darkness and not light, says Amos. But it also does have that other side of it, the physical blessings, the fruitfulness, the prosperity. In Joel chapter 2, in short, the day of the Lord results in judgment poured out upon sinners that subsequently leads to blessing for those who repent in the nation of Israel and bless them upon all of God's people. Peter says, you know, the day of the Lord is coming. He says, look for it. It's important to look to the future. If we flip back to Second Peter chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Well, I'll pick up with 11 to give you some context is since all these things are going to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy contact, conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of their Lord on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by fire and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens. There's that word looking again. Verse 12, we're looking for. Verse 13, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in Him in peace, spotless, blameless. Listen, Jesus is coming back. You know, said it from time, and there's scoffers, Pastor Jeff talked about that somewhat, but He's coming back, and He is on schedule. Not slack. He's not forgotten. He's not having difficulties. He's not been put on a detour. That detour. He is coming back. And Peter wants you to know that there's a storm coming. Be ready. A storm was going to result in this whole world being burned up. Right there. At the end of the millennium, this whole universe is burned up. And it's replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. We talk about what that means, and that gets into a deep study. 
But I'm going to tell you that it talks about a complete and total destruction of this world because it's been tainted by sin. The storm is coming. And we should be ready. See, isn't it amazing that when they talk about storms coming, hurricanes, there's some people go out and they, and they stock up, they buy things, they board up their homes, they prepare. And yet even many Christians today, when we read these things, and Peter says, it's coming. The day of the Lord is coming and it makes no real impact. Certainly not on the world, and unfortunately not upon many Christians. And one of the reasons is because we don't promote prophecy. We say, oh, it's just, uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't know, and we just ignore it. Those churches won't touch prophecy. But if you're bound and determined to study the scriptures, you must study all the Word of God, and you can't. Ignore those things that seem to be a little bit difficult or a little bit controversial. You need to delve into them. They're not that difficult. Yes, some of the details we don't know, we're not sure about, but the general broad overview can be very clear to you. And these things we bring to you and promote prophecy because they are practical. You know, the answer says, are we living further now or living further now. Because what we're looking for and who we're looking for is going to impact the way that we view this world and the way that we view others and those that are around us. Because what's really practical, one of the things that's really practical about this is that prophecy and understanding prophecy gives you a, a motivation for godly living. Understanding the day of the Lord gives you a motivation for godly living. This is what he says in, in verse 11. He says, since all things are to be destroyed in this way. All things. Everything in this world is going to be destroyed. You know, there's a creation of six days. There's going to be an uncreation that's coming. This world is unraveling at the scene. And God's going to intervene and even hasten that process. The Spirit of God tells us in Psalm 75, 3, The earth and all who dwell in it melt, and it is I who have firmly set its pillars. That's pretty clear. You know, without the Lord Jesus, this whole world flies apart at the seams even now. He, that is, Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together, Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17. All things hold together in him. You ever think about when you give thanks to God? God, thank you. I thank you, Lord, for holding all things together. Without him, there is no way. He said, since we know that all things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What we ought to be. What's our obligation? What's our obligation? And, and what Peter's really saying here, you know, in light of all these things, that's in the Living Bible. I, I, you know, the Living Bible, which is just a paraphrase, but I love it, it says, and so, since everything around us is going to melt away, the living uh, Bible translation says, what holy, godly lives we should be living. How astoundingly excellent you ought to be. And that really can, it, it catches the nuance of the Greek words here. He's saying, how astoundingly, how astonishingly excellent we ought to be living in this realm of time. That's the kind of people we ought to be. And he says again, you know, to ourselves. How ought we live to ourselves? We ought to be in holy conduct and, and godliness. He says you need to live in the sphere, in the Greek, in, in, the, in the atmosphere of holiness. 
We ought to live in that realm. Everything that we do should be based in the holiness of God. The path that you take in your life ought to be holy and set apart unto God. The power that we depend on is the Holy Spirit. We should manifest moral maturity at, at all times. That's what Peter's been saying throughout the study of, of First and Second Peter. I'm, I'm going to remind you again of what he said in, in First Peter chapter two and verse eleven. He said, "Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers, why this world's burning up. This world's going to come to an end. There's not much future in the earth. Don't invest in it." I mean, if you were on uh, Wall Street and they came and said, I want you to invest in this company. Oh, really? How's it going? Well, it's going bankrupt. Would you invest? Are you nuts? I lose enough money as it is. Right? He says, listen, I, 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 I urge you as well as you stand to abstain from the fre- freshly lost which they war against the soul. He said, don't invest in the things of the world and the sin of the world and the unrighteousness of the world, the lusts of the world. In, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses uh, 14 to 16, he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But what's he say? You don't have that ignorance anymore. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We're destined for different places, folks. We're different. We're destined for a new heaven and a new earth. And who's going to rule and reign in the new heaven and the new earth ultimately? The Lord Jesus. Who's going to rule and reign in the thousand years in the millennial kingdom? The Lord Jesus. Who wins? The Lord Jesus. Who are you going to side with? Who are you going to look to? What are you going to live for? Are you going to live for the now or the new? See, when you know Christ and Savior, your position of what is holiness, you have been set apart unto God. Your position is holiness. You are a saint. That's your position. But here Paul calls for us to be experiential in our holiness. And the problem with a lot of Christians is that their practice doesn't match their position. And when you have a position of holiness, but you live according to lust, when your position doesn't, uh, when your practice doesn't match your position, your position, what do you have? What do you have? Your conflict. You have dissatisfaction. You have misery in your life. A lot of Christians, you know, they have a position, so they're not literally living that way, they're not practicing that, and then they wonder why their lives are so miserable. Because they stand in here and he's messed up. There's a new heaven, there's a new earth, we're going to be there. The Lord Jesus, everything's going to be great. Why do I feel so miserable? Because you're not really looking for that. Because there's a conflict in your life. So we have an obligation to live up to our position. That's our obligation to ourselves. But we have an obligation to others as well. To be a witness to the perishing. Everything in this world, it says, is going to perish. That includes unbelievers. That includes everything that they possess. But see, we don't have that obligation. If we have an understanding of perhaps we understand what's coming down the road and the day of the Lord's coming, we say for unbelievers, there's nothing good for them there. It's all about them losing everything they even have now. But we fall into this trap of looking at unbelievers and we look at them and say, you know what, they've got a nice family. And you know what, they're having a great time. And you know what, they love sports. And you know what? They're talented. And you know what? They have three cars in the drive. And you know what? They have a barbecue out back. And you know what? They're doing pretty good. They're living in a dying world and things that are all going to burn up. 
And she was like, I just said, I know the Lord. I'm going to heaven. I'm blessed. We are blessed. But what about them? What about your neighbor? Is it enough that they have a barbecue? Is it enough that they have a big screen, flat screen TV? I was just driving by a house the other night and I was getting dark and I was looking with and they had a big picture window and I looked in the front man and it was, and, and right on across I guess was the big screen TV. I filled up the whole picture window. I said, Oh, what a TV. But your knees gonna burn up. Do we really care? Are you really witnessing to, to the people? Do you care about the future? Or are you just living for the now? Do you care about their future? Because, yeah, you look at them now, they seem pretty good. They work out. They go to the gym. Well, she's looking fine. They're living in a dying world. And without Christ, they're headed to a lost eternity. Prophecy, the future things that are coming, should motivate us to try to rescue the perishing. Care for the dying, right? Oh, they agree that sing that song, it's a care for the dying. Oh, that means old people in the hospital. That means every person outside of Christ. They're dying. Our church is all we're doing, you know, we're like swap and stick, you know. We're, we're you know, uh, I get these people from this church come here for a while, then they go down the road for a while, and let's go out and get the unchurched. Win your neighbors. That's the only people we talk to Christ about are ones that already know it. Here's that, you know, my church is better than the one you're going to. Why don't you come over there? Why don't you over here? Why don't you join us? Why don't you talk to that fellow there who doesn't know anything about Christ, doesn't care anything? Well, because he don't know. He's dying. It's like his house is on fire. He comes in, you're going to call the neighbor's house on fire. Oh, she don't want me to call him now. His house is on fire. Help me. We should be sharing with our friends with our family. We should be inviting people out to church. Hey, you need to come. Hey, you need to listen to this. Hey, these guys are preaching for you, and they're kind of funny looking, but you might, you might learn something there. And you're studying the scriptures, and you can witness to them. You have this great motivation. Well, these people are in trouble. If you know the terrorists were going to attack Pottstown next week, they were going to attack the Pottstown Hospital, you get down there and stand out front and say, everybody get out of here. Tomorrow it's happening. Tomorrow it's coming. Now, we don't know exactly what day it's coming, but we know it's coming for those that are lost. What are we doing about it? Do we care? We didn't get very far today, but we're quitting it. Because I want to pick this up and look at the expectation of the end and the, uh, and the, the culmination in rightness. We'll pick that up next week. Prophecy is ever important. Future things are important because it molds and shapes who we are. Don't let people tell you, ah, oh, obviously, forget that stuff. It's not practical. Peter keeps bringing us back here. Peter thought it was practical. The Spirit of God thinks it's practical. Practical for me, it's practical for the world. Amen? Let's go. I have any problem. We live in a world sometimes, and because we tire, people think, and sometimes we even buy into that, that you're not a God of righteousness. Father, you're not going to judge people. And then the other times, Father, we forget about the blessing that comes. 
Father, in the future, yes, there will be judgment, but there's also a day. There's also a blessing. There's also a world that's coming that's filled with righteousness. That's nothing but righteousness. And Father, only because of the blood and the blood of the Lord Jesus, we can be part of that. Acknowledging that we're sinners and that we were destined for hell and for damnation, we can have life everlasting because the Lord Jesus purchased us as His bride. Oh, Father, I pray that every one of us would receive that here and those who have received that we go out and tell others. I follow the body of Christ might grow. Now, this assembly might grow, yes, to maturity, but also numerically, because it means that others are coming to know Christ, and becoming part of the family of God here. I pray, Father, we would have a, a desire to look for the new instead of living for the now. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment as we study future things. They are vitally important. And we pray that we might be at the forefront of these things as we study your word and can share with others the truth. With unbelievers or even believers who have given up. Understanding that which is coming, that which you have given to us to prepare us, to warn us, to comfort us, to make us expectant make us be witnesses of that which is to come to pass. We thank you and praise you for Jesus' name. Please stay as we say. Jesus is coming again. Thank you for that promise of a new heaven, a new earth. And in this life, we're tempted so many different ways. Lord, keep us in your grace, keep us in your will. That we can live holy lives, not for the sake of just being holy, Lord, but for the sake of bringing you glory, for the sake of showing others that we are different, that you have changed us, not in our own power because of your love, because of your grace, and that they would be added to our number, we would be true lights to the world, salt to the earth. Let us never forget your promise of coming back. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.